Yeah. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ellen Harrell, and I'm the executive director for the Louisiana Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative. Um, we are here for part four of our five part webinar series on winter forages in Louisiana. Um, if you've been following with us the whole time, thanks for being here. We also have the previous three sessions recorded on our YouTube page. Um, and this session will be recorded and posted this afternoon. So if you just have way too much information and need to come back to it, you are going to be able to do that this afternoon, as well as if you'd like to send this to other people in your networks, please, um, you'll get a follow up email at the end. Once the posting is recorded with both the link and a survey. Um, this webinar series has been made possible by the National Wildlife Federation and NRCS, so it would be really helpful for our grant, as well as just knowing how to structure future webinar series to get some of y'all's feedback um, once you get that email survey. So today we have Dr. Pat Bagley from Southern University and Wedge Barth, who is a producer in Louisiana, talking about how and when to graze winter forages. Um, we're going to have them do a presentation, but also if you guys have any questions and need to jump in, you're more than welcome to add those in the chat. They may ask if you have any questions throughout their presentation and let you guys unmute and talk. Um, but if not, at the end, we'll definitely have a round for questions. And then at the end of the call, about five minutes till the hour, um, Bethany is going to do a drawing for all of y'all that are on today. We'll be eligible to win our Louisiana Grazing Lines t-shirt. Um, so whoever wins, you'll get that mailed to your house. Um, and then also by participating today, you're getting into a drawing for a hundred dollar gift certificate for um, cover crop seeds. And yeah, so we're going to get started. We'll do that drawing by the end of the hour. But then um, if you need to stay on after and want to continue the conversation, please do. But we'll try to kind of wrap things up within the hour. So with that being said, we're going to kick it off with Dr. Bagley, if you have some thoughts and then I think some follow up with Wedge um, and we're good to go. Thank you so much. Great. And it's good to have everybody here today. And of course, uh, one of the problems with winter forages is they all require rainfall and we have not had any. Uh, I don't know how the rest of the state, I think, is quite a bit better off than we are down here in South Central. Uh, we've gone about 60 days with less than a quarter of an inch of rain. So it's been tough. And I'm, I've got an own farm research project over in DeRitter. And uh, they keep telling me how much, it's not a lot of rain, but they've gotten several good rains since then. And of course, as we all know, seed don't, do not germinate unless they get wet and imbibe some water. But at the same, and uh, of course, uh, cool, these are annuals, uh, although a lot of the ryegrasses will reseed themselves and do a pretty good job of those kind of things. Uh, there's a, there's been a lot of development, right, varietal development in these kind of things, but it depends on uh, classically what we'd like to think of. When I was at the Rose Pine Station in Southwest Louisiana, we depended on having the ground ready. We do a lot of prepared seed bed for some very thorough grazing, and we usually plant those by September 21st. That was always our date to have it in there, generally by November the 15th, but uh, wedge, we'd usually have some rainfall between those two periods of time. We would have grass that would be anywhere from about 12 to 14 inches tall that was ready for grazing. Um, a lot of ours were continuous grazing, but the nice thing I'd say about ryegrass pastures, and you could put some clovers and other grass we, we can talk about, uh, the gains on those pastures are just almost phenomenal. Uh, one of the things, not phone is going off, one of the things that we get into is that. Uh, uh, gains on these things on larger steers, we've gotten gains of almost three pounds a day for long periods of time. These are not struck down cattle. These are cattle that are weighing six and 700 pounds at roughly a year of age. Uh, and larger animals uh, will gain faster than what a smaller animal will in the same quality pasture. They, there's an economy of size and scale. A bigger animal can simply eat a lot more than a smaller animal can. A smaller animal, more of their uh, intake is going to go into maintenance, which is primarily body heat. As I've explained to students in the classroom, if you think uh, maintenance is not an expensive product, think about uh, turning your house uh, thermostat up to 101 degrees in the middle of winter and leaving it there for a while, and you'll see an extreme heating bill that you get into. Cows, humans as well, have that same thing on a continuous kind of basis, where you get into these kind of things where it's an expensive thing to be alive. 
bigger animals can simply eat a lot more than smaller animals that can, that can overcome this thing. But um, I, we always had the process of thinking that by the time you get to Christmas, you're probably not going to grow any more grass until you get to be about the 1st of February. Uh, cool season annuals, they do well in the cool season, but they simply do not uh, grow with cold temperatures. The, the growth rate is very, very small. So whatever you got by December, the, by December the 15th, you need to parcel that out if it's grazing steers, because you're not going to grow much more until February the 1st or so when the weather turns nice. And of course, climate is so important in all these things. Uh, our summer grass is a little more consistent. Rainfall with thunderstorms tend to be a little more consistent. Uh, it seems like in the wintertime, we go from extremely wet conditions to somewhat dry conditions. The cold is going to impact those. We also get some trampling effect, and those trampling effects can be pretty good. Uh, we had some rotational grazing studies where we where we used ryegrass when I was over at Rose Pine. And uh, one of the problems you get into is you've got, we had a 15 pasture cycle. So they were on pastures for about two days, then they were off for, for 28. So what we would always see was that those pastures, when it was in wet conditions, those things looked terrible when those cattle came out trampled and stomped down, you swear they were going to come back, but you know, 28 days later, perfect looking again, lots of grass over there. So, uh, you know, you'd like to think that it won't get wet and nasty, but wintertime in Louisiana is going to get wet and nasty. You're not going to have any proposals other than that. We, uh, there's a lot of ryegrass development that's gone on. One of the issues we get down here in the Southern part of the state is uh, the disease called rust that can be uh, uh, a pretty serious problem. Uh, of all things, when I was at Mississippi State University, one of the states that I was in charge of was a station just out of, outside of Memphis in Holly Springs. And that's uh, that uh, station is located in Marshall County. And that word Marshall rings a bell is because Marshall ryegrass was developed there. And it was developed by the, the superintendent was in charge of the station was a cheap guy and he planted ryegrass one year and he thought it's too expensive to plant. So the next year he just dis just the field up about the middle of August. And he did that for about 20 years. And he, whatever volunteered to come up was the ryegrass that was selected. And there was a group, I forgot what the seed company, the name of the seed company was. They were flying to Memphis one day. And it was a really cold, hard winter that year. And they were flying over North Louisiana and on a commercial jet. Uh, North Mississippi just happened to look down and there was one, they said it was one green field in all of North Mississippi. And they tracked their way back to find it. And that was that field of grass, right? That was volunteer ryegrass. So they went in there and selected the seed out and they named it Marshall for Marshall County. But it was not a very pure selection. So what, the, what they got into, there were various ecotypes. Jackson is one of the selections. Jackson, the parent to Jackson is a uh, Marshall ryegrass. But Jackson was selected out because it's not, it uh, doesn't get the disease rust nearly as well, nearly as much as what Marshall does. Understand that in Marshall ryegrass in uh, in North Mississippi, rust never occurs. So there was never any pressure from the disease rust on the Marshall. They selected some of the ecotypes out. So there's a lot of good varieties out there. We use a lot of Nelson ryegrass right now. Uh, we like to put some clovers in there. Uh, one of the clovers we found that I was quite happy with was arrowleaf clover. It's kind of fallen out of popularity again. If you think about our legumes, they tend to add about, when you got a good scent, they'll add about 10% to whatever level of gain you got. Uh, so what we would run into was airleaf clover is one of those few clovers that it, it will take close continuous grazing or it can be in a nice rotational graze. Uh, white clover tends to like to be continuously grazed. Red clover likes to be rotationally grazed. Airleaf doesn't care. It'll uh, pretty much treat any way you want to, and it's got a fairly high tannin level which tells you that it won't, uh, it doesn't cause bloat very much. Uh, the other thing is, is there are issues with bloat on ryegrass. Uh, uh, in fact, if you go out into the Midwest, there's always a lot of, of bloat on wheat pastures and wheat pastures and ryegrass pastures, all, almost synonymous, synonymously with those. So uh, and bloat is one of those issues and Wedge might want to speak to that. I have not seen them in any cases of bloat. Everybody's always concerned about it. But the problem with bloat is, is you've just got your quality, the quality of your forage is just too darn high. And it's hard to be somebody in the agricultural industry that you're trying to promote high quality forages. And all of a sudden people start complaining about bloat. And the only problem, only thing that causes bloat is extremely high quality forages. So it's uh, it's kind of one of those griping about too, it being too wealthy or too high quality forages. It's hard to get too upset about those things. So 
Uh, with that, I'll kind of I'll kind of stop that overview. Uh, you you we also we would continuously graze uh, steers on rye grass, and we get about 190 to 200 days grazing out of it. They'd average about two and a quarter a day gain. So you're talking about almost 500 pounds of gain on a steer. Uh, the profit mark, we always thought our cost, and this was our ag accounts we worked on that, uh, worked it out, and this is some older figures, but our cost of gain was only about 20 cents a pound. The other thing we used a lot of it for was a creek grazing area for calves. We had fall born calves. And of course, as you know, there's not much out there to graze in December, January, and February. So we would prepare seed bed an area of about, for 10 calves, we'd have one acre for every 10 calves. Uh, amazingly, when we compare to creek grazing versus non-creek bed steers, those on creek grazing, average weaning weight was 75 pounds heavier. And our cost of gain on that, of course, they were with mamas most of the time, their cost of gain was only about 15 cents a pound. So, you know, if, you got, if you're selling calves for a buck 60 a pound, your cost is 15 cents, you're going to make a lot of money on those guys. And the nice thing about small calving, when you sell those guys in June and July, the price is quite a bit higher than it is in September and October. So with that little bit of kind of an overview, let me turn it over to, to uh, Wedge and we can uh, let Wedge speak and then uh, we can proceed on from there if y'all want to. So Wedge. Thank you, Pat. Um, welcome everybody, glad to be with you. I'm gonna address this thing from the standpoint of the cow and the producer. Um, when do you start grazing your ryegrass? Well, as Patty said, we are having a huck of a time getting it growing this year because of lack of moisture. Um, we're in a study with Pat, it's a three year study. We are a control graze operation, been doing it better than 40 years. Uh, some people say we graze postage stamp size uh, paddocks, which in that case would be 35 adult animals on a 90 foot wide strip by 90 foot deep until the first one lays down and then they're out of there and back into a sacrifice area with hay and water and whatever else. We try not to supplement feed if we have to. We just had a load of feed come in for some replacement heifer candidates that we've got weaning right now. And that feed's running $359 a ton. That's up over $100 a ton from what it was a couple of years ago. So feeding is not the answer. Ryegrass, while it is expensive to plant, you're looking at probably $180 an acre. And that's really not counting a lot of labor or equipment. You get an awful lot of grazing off of it. Uh, in our case, we graze those paddocks for, like I say, a couple of hours and they get out. Then they go back to a new one the second day, the third day, a new one, the fourth day, a new one. Of course, you have to have a good fencing system, and we use a lot of electric fence pardon me, fencing. Um, that regrowth that comes back on that ryegrass starts in the third day after you graze it, in my opinion. If you graze that ryegrass too low, you take out all the solar collectors of the plant, all the leaf area, and then you extend the recovery time because the plant has to go back to root reserve to be able to start regrowing. So when do you start grazing it? Pat threw out a number anywhere from 12 to 18 inches tall. Well, I would a little bit disagree with that, but not really. The biggest thing that I would caution everyone is that when you turn your cattle into an area of grass, if you don't have it partitioned off in some way, they are gonna walk across that entire area. They're gonna foul it. They're gonna lay down on it. They're gonna eat a little of it. But for every time they cross through there, you are losing percentages of your grass. And expensive as that grass is to maintain and get there, you wanna make sure that every bit of it goes through that four and a half inch wide combine throat on the front end of that cow, passes through that gut system and comes out as fertilizer on the backside. So 
this is a, a ball game that changes almost daily. Now, Pat mentioned some cold weather and things like that. Uh, I personally will not put cows in a pasture that has a heavy frost on it. I definitely would not put cows in a pasture that has ice upon it. Now, snow is a different story, and snow in Louisiana is a rarity. But if we do have a snow, once that stuff begins to melt, when that temperature gets above 32 degrees and that snow begins to melt, you can turn those cows into that paddock and they will root the green grass out of the snow. Of course, if we get two inches, that's a heavy snow in Louisiana, of course. But those are the things that are important to me. Um, we've been trying this. I, I have a thing that I talk about a lot of times. I say we have the golf course type pastures. We have intensive grazing pastures. We have management intensive grazing pastures. Then we went through a period of uh, mob grazing. And now we're into a new realm called regenerative grazing. Um, actually, there's very little difference between them. The biggest thing that we have to recall and remember is that ryegrass is a winter annual. We have no perennial annuals in this part of the world. So we have to use that ryegrass as our primary source of nourishment for that animal. And it is probably the cheapest way to do it, but we've got to extend it in every way we can. Um, and that, that's my basic take on all of this. Um, the study that we're in with Dr. Pat right now, um, I hope that some of the information that they are taking and getting, we will be able to give you some better answers at the end of three years of our program. He has two doctorate students that are working their backsides off to make this thing work. Uh, but Pat, you got anything on that? And now we'll comment further on. Yeah, it's uh, the winter grazing pastures. Those are some extremely high quality things, but the production is variable. Uh, one of the kind of problems that you run into when you think about it, Wedge, is uh, we promote you know, no tillage buildup your soil organic matter, improving soil health. But if you don't, just for, for a lot of winter grazing, particularly fall winter grazing, if you don't disturb the soil and hurt those Bahia grass, Bermuda grass plants and plant dry grass in there, uh, you're not going to get much production until later on in the year. Uh, one of the great values I've always thought is if you think about ryegrass uh, up until about the time you get into early April, the crude protein content in ryegrass typically will run around 25%. So all of a sudden I've got, as Wedge said, I've got the perfect protein supplement out there and it doesn't take a lot. Uh, and cows, you know, cows are a lot smarter than all humans give them credit for. Uh, we, we would limit graze those guys. So uh, you know, everybody thinks it's hard to get cows out of a ryegrass pasture. It's not. Uh, we would we, we would uh, we would go by there about eight eight fifteen, turn the cows in there for a couple of hours, and generally by the time you come back at ten o'clock, they were at the gate getting ready to leave because they knew you're going to run them out anyway. So they they get their fill. So all of a sudden, you know, when you think about supplemental feeds, protein supplements are where the expense is. Uh, you know, they're they're quite expensive. Uh, as again, one of my kind of rules of thumb, if I'm going to talk to somebody about supplementing my a pasture, I never want to put a high starch feed out there. Starch uh, interacts with the breakdown of the cellulose, but there's some good feeds. There's a corn gluten feed that's fairly inexpensive. Uh, it's uh, moderate, it's only got about 50% crude protein, but it's all fiber. There's no starch in it. So it's a good supplement. But you know, again, anytime you start bringing a bag out to a pasture, you run the expense up quite a bit. So there's some problems with it. Uh, the problems with mudding in a pasture, you know, cows, big old cows walking across that, they can tear up a pasture pretty good if it's moist or if it's frozen, those kind of things, which is why creek grazing, it's a little like creek feeding. It's just, we had a little opening in the fence, 14 inches wide, four feet tall. And we, the cows never got into those pastures where we had these, these uh, nice ryegrass pastures. 
uh, I used to get asked the question, well, those calves really go out there where the ryegrass is. And I said, oh, not until they're at least three days of age, because I've seen three-day-old calves walk away from their mothers. And the thing I always liked about it is they only go to those pastures to graze. If you think about babies like that, where they want to be is with their mother. So if they're hungry, they'll walk into those creek grazing areas and creek graze out there. And as soon as they get their fill, they come back to mama. And of course, you're only talking about calves weigh two and 300 pounds, so they're not going to damage that uh, that sod very much anyway. But again, you can, uh, that, that was by far the most profitable thing we ever did with cattle was to have a creek grazing area there because we had such a good cost return. It was just almost uh, shocking to think about those kind of things. And Dr. Pat, that was on um, baby calves is what you're talking about? Or is that weanlings, yearlings? Does that work? Yeah, these are animal? baby calves. Yeah, these okay. are baby calves. And uh, what we would do, the cows would be on like the permanent pasture. So the cow, you know, we're talking about uh, December, January, and February. The cows are on hay, maybe a little supplemental feed if the protein's there. And just adjacent to it, we have a little hole in the fence and had a prepared seed bit of uh, ryegrass. And again, it was, we would stock it with only one acre for every 10 calves. So if it was 40 calf, cow calf pairs, we only talking about four acres that, that we get into and disturb the soil like that. And that was always plenty enough forage to, for those calves because, of course, when they're first being born in September and October, they're not very large. They'll eat a lot. And by the time you get out into the spring, those ryegrass pastures get very productive. You know, you, it's a wedge. I've always thought the problem with it is when you're talking about steers on our prepared seed beds, we were talking about stocking it a little more than one steer per acre. But by the time you get into March, you need about 10 steers per acre to keep up with all of it. So, uh, it, And so what typically we would do uh, Tara, we would creep graze the calves all year long while we had limited forages. And then we get into, in the middle of March, 1st of April, when the grass starts growing really quick, we would let, we get off the protein supplements and we'd let those cows limit graze out there, which is, we let them in there for two hours, come back and they, they'd always walk right back out because I guess they knew they weren't supposed to be out there, but it's a, but in all these things, and I'm sure Wedge agrees with it. If you think about managing these things, the first thing, you know, manage starts with M-A-N. Somebody has to be out there and know and look at the cattle. Uh, you know, Wedge and I can tell you some of these general kind of things like that, but you've got to be on site and, and realize Mother Nature sometimes is nice to you. Sometimes she's not so nice to you, and you have to react to her and what those cows need. The cows are pretty good about telling you what they need. If they're hungry, they're going to walk the fence line. If they're, if they're satisfied, they're going to be walking back to the gate to be let out of those ryegrass pastures because they know they're not supposed to be in there long term. Now, I want to get down. That's great information, Dr. Pat. I would like to get down to the nitty gritty, kind of on the very basic level for you guys. Um, because Josh and I, I think y'all both know, we've only been farming since 2016. So we've pretty much had a lot more failed attempts at ryegrass and winter <laughs> forages than we have succeeded at this point. So to help someone like us, who's just, we have a lot of beginning farmers coming up and coming these days. When, whenever we say when to graze ryegrass, I know you guys mentioned a height. Number one, we, it's, an, it's an observed, I think we talked uh, previously in some other webinars about, I don't know if we said a planting date or not, but most people in South Louisiana plant October 15th is kind of our target window. And Justin had said kind of your, I mean, Justin or Ted one had said in our first webinar that kind of your deadline is almost November 1st to get any early grazing. Now we have planted later than that and gotten late grazing after February. It's gonna be a long-term deal if you plant later and prepared versus non-prepared seed beds, um, you know, overseeding without disturbing the soil at all, which we've tried. And then drilling is a whole nother story. And then, you know, prepared seed bed is a whole third story. So really three different scenarios for planting here. So let's just take all those planting scenarios and kind of level the field and say, at what height do you start putting cattle on your ryegrass? Period for both of you. Well, that's that's well, my yeah. stage one. Go ahead, Pat. That, that's a, that's a tough one. Again, that that's getting the feel and the knowledge about all this kind of stuff. Uh, most times, if you're talking about drilling, sod seeding, whatever that is. Uh, there'll be a few years that you'll hit the climatic conditions just right. You'll get a nice, productive fall grazing. Uh, I, if I were you, I would not depend on that. Most of the time, you're not going to have a lot of grazing on a, on a sod-seeded pasture or a grain driller or even a spread on the back of a fertilizer server. You're not going to get much growth until on into about the middle of February. 
So it depends. It, and again, what it, you just got to figure out my management plan. When do I need? When do I need forages? And that uh, but at middle what of height, at what height? You know what I'm saying? Like that's a when question. At what actually? What am I looking for to say that ryegrass is ready or not ready? My personal take on it would be nothing less than ten inches. Um, if you take it more, if you're going to a pasture that the ryegrass is only 10 inches high, you've, you've only got a certain number of leaves available. And when you graze those leaves off, then you're going to lose that solar collector ability and you're going to push yourself back in the corner. Uh, the study that we're on with Dr. Pat right now, uh, we have one 14 acre field that we planted. We do do a limited till on it. And that 14 acre field normally would have been planted probably October the 15th, but moisture has killed that. We just got it in the ground last Monday. Uh, normally we may see grass by the second week of December to put those animals on. This year, if we see it the first of January, we'll be lucky. Um, so what we're doing in replace of that right now, we have some stockpile pasture. Actually, it's a four acre field that has not had any fertilization, commercial fertilization put on it since 2008. Uh, we interceded on top of the ground with different types of clovers, vetch and other things. Uh, it had some chicken litter put on it twice, but that field is still green right now, even after we had those two early frost. Uh, we are now putting those replacement heifer candidates is what I call them. They are yearlings. They are in those green grasses and we're also supplementing them with a 12% feed, but about a pound a day per head, eating a lot of hay. Now here's, here's one thing when you're grazing ryegrass, it is, in my opinion, very important to have medium quality hay available to those animals. That product is so watery, it is so loose that it goes through the animal almost as fast as a snowball mills. We put some hay in there, you put some binder in there, you give it a little bit more chance to stay in the rumen, stay in the bypass pick up bypass protein going through the gut and it comes out on the backside in what I like to call a pumpkin pie mixture. If it's too loose, it's doing them no good. If it's the right mixture, it's doing them a lot of good. And if it piles up like cannonballs, it's not doing anything. You've wasted your time. Uh, Pat's laughing about that one. Um, so that field of 14 acres last year, We've got it planted, I think, around the 15th of October. We had moisture. We first grazed it the 5th of December, and we grazed it all the way through the year. The first time we went through, we grazed it in half paddocks, and that was a paddock in that field is 90 feet wide by about 250 feet long. We did it in half paddocks all the way through the first time. The second time they had gained. We did it in single paddocks that time. And if my memory serves me correct, we got across that field four times between December the 5th and in the spring when that grass played out finally. So it is an economical way to do it. But as Pat said, management is the big deal. Uh, you have to be there every day. Uh, and you have to look at your animals. You have to walk among them. Um, I do everything but sing to them because I couldn't sing anyway. <laughs> but I talk to them every day. I'm like Dr. Doolittle. I talk to the animals. And they don't answer, thank goodness. <laughs> but you have to develop a rapport with your animals. And they begin to trust you. Now, let me say this. There's what a couple of breed associations that say their animals are very, very gentle. Folks, that's true, they are. However, that big animal can hurt you 
before you even realize it. So don't go out there and think you're going to pet these things like pity little cats in the house. They are a big piece of machinery and they will hurt you. Um, Sarah, yeah. I'll go back uh, to kind of specifically yeah. answer your question. Uh, the in, NRCS for many years had this mantra about take half, leave half. That's not a bad thing to get into in this thing because as Wedge talked about, you have to think about this grass is, is like that leaf is a solar panel. Only way that that plant has to produce, to generate energy is through those solar panels being exposed to the sunshine. You take them all off, now there will be some root reserves, but you're going to slow that plant down. So particularly early in the year, you want to be very cautious about how much top growth you remove. Uh, once you get into February, when, when the weather warms up and things get better, you probably can't keep up with it, but that's that's a nicer problem. But uh, again, you you cannot overgraze these things because it just takes them so back long to, to compensate. You know, you think about uh, a little one inch leaf just does not collect that much sunshine as compared to a leaf that's 10 inches long. It's going to pretty good. It's going to catch 10 times as much. And different from our summer grasses, as you as you recognize, all these cool season annuals we're talking about are all leaf. Now they'll produce a seed head, but not until April or May. So all that top growth is leaf and all that leaf is capable of producing, capturing and do, doing photosynthesis. And our Bermuda grasses, Bahia grasses, those things send up a stem, which is not leaf material, which is not gonna be very photosynthetic active. So again, just be careful that management thing about uh, don't overgraze these seeds too much because when you remove that, that top growth from it, uh, if it's cold weather, it's just not gonna grow much at all anymore. So when, when you're looking out at your field, so I know you're out there every day and you do two out, two or three hours on and then pull them off. Um, a lot of people don't have that luxury. We don't, we, we're farming. Um, if you saw last week's webinar, we're farming four different lease land properties. And um, so we don't have the luxury of going out every day and doing the two hour thing. We have one farm that's set up that we rotate every day. It's 22 paddocks and we remove them daily or every other day or every three days, depending on the grass growth. So it's really a more of a visual thing for us. So I'd love to know what you're looking, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I, I've heard the solar panel thing a lot of times and I just don't see little solar panels on the on the grass. So I, it took me a, like years to kind of figure out what are people talking about with this <laughs> solar panel thing? Um, I don't understand. So is there like a growth point? You know, is there a, if you graze to, you know, if this is the, the height of 10 inches right here and we take half, is there a growth point where it's too much and it's not going to grow back anymore? Is there a... In my opinion, if it looks like putting green on the golf course, you have woefully gone too long. Okay. Um, when, do you, when do you know to stop? How do, what are you looking for to say, that's <laughs> enough? Let's, let's As let's Pat see. just said, that the, the NRCS statement take half, leave half, is probably pretty accurate. Uh, now, in the case where you're not seeing those animals but every third or fourth day, then you have another axiom that comes in there that grazing management is as much an art as it is a science. So what you have to learn how to do then is to allocate a large enough area for a four-day graze and then move on to something else, but still leave a residual. I know years ago when intensive grazing management was the big terminology, everybody thought the intensiveness was how hard we grazed the grass. Now, my little brother thought that we had to get every ounce of green material <laughs> off of that field and into that cow. Now, that was good, however, it was 40 days before we were able to come back and get another mouthful. So all of this works around how you have to, and then mother nature, let's, let's say, we are working within the confines of mother nature's realm. And the sooner we realize that we have to work in concert with her, instead of being telling her, we're gonna make you do what we wanna do, that is not gonna happen. Mother Nature rules the world and controls everything. We're just here to work with her. And I think that's the, one of the main things that a lot of folks don't realize. Uh, 
Tara, maybe you think about uh, you know stockpiling forages has been a been a buzzword around for a long, long time. And think about the in the fall, I probably need to think about stockpiling. I don't want to remove all of it. I want to uh, manage it to where I can parcel this stuff out so I can get to springtime. Because once I get to springtime, I can't keep up with it all of a sudden. And of all things, uh, uh, when we first started about stockpiling, tall fescue was the first crop we we ever. I got very heavy into stockpiling, and I had published the first research work on stockpiling fescue when I was a graduate student at Virginia Tech. And no, everybody thought we were crazy because tall fescue was looked upon as a weed in uh, Virginia. You know, they had orchard grass and bluegrass. Everybody loved. Everybody hated tall fescue. What we saw is that when you start accumulating that grass on there, and when the weather starts getting cool, uh, tall fescue accumulates quite a bit of sugar content in it. And cows won't graze orchard grass anymore in the fall. They'll preference to go to tall fescue because it's a tougher grass. It doesn't break down like orchard grass does when it freezes. The, the sugars leak out. And it, uh, and to give you an example, in a typical grass, the sugar content is usually around 3% year round. In stockpile tall fescue, you get up to 21%. So that's why the cows, love, cows are like humans. They got a pretty nice sweet tooth. So as soon as I get these higher levels, and it's all because I've got lots of sunshine, a good growing condition, but the, with the weather too, too cold for it to grow very much, and these plants accumulate lots of sugar, plus they're trying to survive to next year and not use all our reserve, reserves up. So again, it's all about, as which, and I have, it's about the management. It's knowing the fit, knowing what's going on in the plant. I want to, I want to parse this stuff out and just realize once I start grazing, I'm probably not going to have any more grass production per se, dry matter yield, until I get back out into late January, early February. So I, whatever I've got out there, if I want to keep it, I need to, to parcel out to where it lasts that long. So as far as timing Let's goes, Let's talk a little really... bit about stocking rate. And give me some ideas on stocking rate, uh, weight, of the, weight of the cattle that you're going to put out there. Uh, do you have any kind of formula with that? Yeah, there are all able. kinds of formulas, uh, Dave. Um, you better be an Einstein and mathematician to be able to work some of them. Um, I was told by a very successful grazer one time that if the forage was above your heel, you needed to stay out of it. If it was half a leg deep, you could go in there and graze some of it. And when it was knee deep, you were in high cotton. Um, and that goes all the way through the whole season, the whole year that goes into play. Uh, ryegrass, we look at it as a cool season plant. But actually, if we get enough cold weather in that January February time frame where that ground temperature gets below a certain point, you're going to hinder the growth of that grass as well. Uh, ambient temperature is one thing, but ground temperature is also a big factor. Um, on the stocking rate, gosh, Dave, I don't know. Um, I have seen people mob graze, but they move quickly. Uh, I know of one operation out of the state of Louisiana that they had a thousand animals in this mob of animals and they moved them four times a day without anyone being there. They set up everything the day before with automatic opening gates. And as soon as the gate popped open, a thousand cows moved to the next pasture. And I mean, that, that gets into high technology. It gets into <laughs> super bucks. And uh, I don't think I want to go to that program. But I mean, some people have the ability and the climatic conditions to do it. Oh, uh, but stocking rate is, is a thing. Oh, uh, no doubt about it. Um, Stuart will probably address some of that when he's talking next week, I think, on NRCS programs and things. Uh, he has a lot of experience in that. Uh, Pat, what are your thoughts on that? Well, from a graze, uh, our, the stocking rate we used to use, and again, these are on a well-prepared seed bed that uh, we we planted mid-September. 
uh, we'd start grazing mid-November, we would typically stock at 600 to 700 pounds of beef per acre. And these were continuously grazing. But again, you're talking about producing a lot of forage because you turn, you've uh, killed, you know, you've killed the, grass, the perennial grass out and left it behind. One of the things that we started doing is coming behind that, uh, we kind of went to a year-round grazing system. When you think about it, we get 190 to 200 days out of rye grass. That's a lot of grazing time, about as much you get out of Bermuda grass. Well, we started going in behind it, and we would overseed into these rye grass plots before we ended grazing, such so things as millet and some summer annuals. And we'd go in and graze millet as a second crop in there. And then, of course, in the fall, when you get into when the millet starts playing out, we go back in and, and sods. We didn't have to till it up again. We'd go in and sod seed our ryegrass, which is, but of course you don't have that much competition because that annual millet is going out. And let me uh, let me say one thing about millet. We, I was very impressed. There's some there's some dwarf millets out there that we on the second grazing. Now the first grazing we get gains a pound a pound and a quarter a day, but that second grazing where it's kind of stooled out and you get a lot more leaf. We routinely got gains over two pounds a day on steers, and that's the only grass that I know of that we would get those kind of gains in the summer. And, and so we're all clear on this. One of the things that you get into is that lower gains are not just because of forage quality. There's a lot of things going into it. It's the stress on the cattle. You know, one of the things is, is grass is just the opposite of us. A grass, as it gets hotter and hotter, the cell, cell wall gets thicker and thicker and thicker because it's trying to protect protect the nucleus and all stuff from, from boiling away. Uh, as, a, as it's cooler and cooler, those cell walls get thinner and thinner, which is why the quality is usually higher. Just the opposite for us, they have to put these coats on. So uh, as, I, as I get into these uh, thicker cell walls, the grass is slow down. I want to have more leaf area out there. And then also the animal. If you think about uh, humans tend to lose weight in the summer and gain weight in the winters because in the summer times, it's hot and humid, and you just don't feel like eating a lot. Well, if I've got a grass out there that's got a thicker and thicker cell wall, and the cow's out there in 95, 100 degree temperature when it's humid, she doesn't want to eat that much. And of course, the grass doesn't digest that much, and fiber, as fiber breaks down in the cow's stomach, it generates a lot of heat. So there's a lot of, it's not so much the poor, the poor forage quality it is, is there's also these climatic things that go on with a cow, with the system the whole way. And it's just the opposite with ryegrass. How much nicer can it be to be every day is 45, 50 degrees? Cows are loving it. The forage is high quality. Uh, Wedge got on to me about laughing when he was talking about the loose manure. I thought back when I was on the dairy farm, uh, when I was six or seven years old, the only job I could do was to scoop up the manure in the barn. And I went over there one day and this cow started raising her tail. So I ran, I was going to be smart and get behind her and, and catch it in the scoop before it hit the ground. Well, about that time she coughed and she'd been on ryegrass and I got this nice green shower from head to toe. So I realized not to stand behind cows that have been on ryegrass real quick in my life. <laughs> Is it safe to say then as far as stocking rate, you it would be better off looking uh, at, the, at the height of the grass and you talk about the solar panels, whatever, as opposed to weight of the animal. Yeah, it's uh, it's more of the height of the grass is a, there's a direct relationship between forage height and forage yield, uh, and that's one of the things we're working on. The stove the wedge on is is getting to uh, some of these that are better. Uh, you know, they're just a certain. Amount. Most of the time, cows do best if there's about 700 pounds of dry matter uh, available on a per cow basis, and that's usually around four or five inches worth. But grasses don't tend to be as productive. The, the rotational grazing kind of thing, there's a lot of good management techniques to rotational grazing. Uh, you get to keep the cows off. You can sacrifice some pastures. Plus, forage growth rates are simply better because you give the, the, the forages a chance to rest and grow. And if, we, if, um, if I uh, would have thought about it, I would have posted a little slide. When you talk about growth rates, if you think about the historic, the typical hay field that I cut it, uh, on one day and five weeks later, I'm going to cut it a second time. But if we look at growth rates, the growth rate the first week and the second week, there's not much out there. But about that time, those plants started putting on more leaves. So they're collecting more solar radiation. They start to do more photosynthesis. All of a sudden, starting that second week and really in the third and fourth week, I get accelerated growth rates, probably six or eight times higher than I did at that one and two weeks, simply because the grass has more solar panels out there, and I end up with a much higher growth rate. 
which is where I rotational grazing works so well that I get the plants at time to recover and hit their optimum level about where they produce the most most uh, dramatic yield on a per day basis. And that's when they that's when that grass is three and four and five weeks of age. Then all of a sudden what happens to it on these Bermuda grass behavior grasses, the canopy gets tall and you start shading out the bottom. So the bottom leaves start to senesce and break down. And so I'm it's five and six weeks. I'm growing a lot, but I'm losing just as much. So I don't, there's no advantage to going out past that. Very interesting. So you're saying the taller grass is going to, taller winter forages are going to regenerate faster because they have more solar panels on the blade of the grass right now. Yes. It's Wonderful. just, it's just kind of simple physics you get into. It's, uh, there's nothing in this old world for free and growing grass isn't either. So, but it's, uh, again, it's that, as Wes now said, it's that man in management or a woman in management, somebody that's out there and, and pays attention to what's going on because, you know, who would have predicted that this year would have been as dry as it's been? We've never had a year like this in Baton Rouge. So all the things we talk about, uh, you know, 20 years is out the window because we'll probably never in our lifetime see another uh, year like this. But again, it's, it's being active, being out there and simply dealing with what Mother Nature hands you. Um, Dr. Pat and Wedge, we have a question in the chat. Uh, Justin has asked, what about using other tools to help determine, such as a grazing stick or a rising plate meter? Uh, Pat, you want to address the rising plate meter theory? Indirectly, of course, what you still get into, it's all about their, some kind of measurement of plant height. And the simple thing is, if the grass is that tall, there's a little bit out there. If it's this tall, it's twice as much. If it's this tall, it's four times as much. So uh, you also get into density, which is one of the other things we measure in the study with weight is I can have a tall grass, which is not very dense. There's not much out there. But on some of these summer perennials like Bermuda grass and Mahay grass, I get a lots of forage in a small square area. And I can pretty much guesstimate what's what's out there simply by doing a forage height. Just to, all I had to have is a ruler out there. Just walk out, measure it. And I know within reason how much grass I've got. Pat, would you address the um, commercial infrared units that are on the market today? And what is our one of our charges in the project we're in? Yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't put me on the spot like that, Wedge. I'm going to get back at you for doing me that way. <laughs> 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 we got into this. For a lot of good reasons, uh, folks, there's a, a tool out that we, we have purchased. It's a portable NIR machine. Now, classically, when you take a forage sample, used to, you'd send it to a lab, and two or three or four weeks later, you get back and you get back and announce about what the fiber level is, what the protein level is. NRS has the ability, though, it does measures wavelengths. So if I take a forage sample, dry it, I can scan it, and within a few minutes, it tells me exactly what's that, what all those forage quality characteristics are. Uh, and usually what people will tell you is that there's a discrepancy between what the wet chemistry lab says and the NIR, NIR machine tells you. The NIR machine is right because it's they're rarely wrong. Uh, the lab analysis, because I've run lots of thousands of lab samples, you certainly can make some human errors in there. But the goal we had in with the study that Wes is talking about was to have a portable meter that we could take out there and just simply shine it on the forage canopy and we could uh, tell what the forage quality was. Uh, it has not worked that well. We're doing some work with Rocky Lemus as well. We're, we're cooperating on this study and what we find out is that they're not going to work unless you dry, at least this, this series, unless you dry the forages down. So all of a sudden you have to take a forage yield and you can dry it in a microwave within just a couple of minutes. But it's just, a, you know, Wedge doesn't bring a microwave out to the farm with him every time we're out there. I'd, I'd be heating my sandwiches up if he were. But all of a sudden, it's just this one more step. Uh, and it's kind of one of those things uh, right now, the technology is, is simply hasn't caught up where the science is. You would like to think that uh, the cost of these machines would have gone down. The good ones run around 25, 30,000. The ones we got is more like five or 6,000. And it's kind of like that we got just exactly what we paid for. So far, we hadn't been able to calibrate that very much. But what we're trying to do with Rocky Lemus' very expensive machine is now we'll go back with at least these dried samples and calibrate it to where 
on a worst case scenario, we could always take some samples, dry them, and then scan those things in, and we could give you some forage quality. But uh, Terry, if you think about it, that doesn't answer all the questions because if you think about it on a standing forage, if you scan it, you're just seeing that top canopy. When a cow reaches her mouth down in there, she might be taking four or five inches because she wraps that tongue and she might pull off four or six inches. When we scan that top of that grass, we're only going to get the very top of it. And of course, plants grow from the top, which tells you, Tara, that I'm going to get an, a, an example of the very highest quality that's in that forage because I'm just getting those top few leaves and I'm not getting down when she gets that mouthful. I'm not getting all that, the third and fourth tier of samples like that down there. So, uh, which almost means that you've got to harvest, you got to guesstimate that it's an eight inch canopy height that she's going to graze the top four. So I've got to take a sample that's roughly four inches tall, dry it and do these kind of things and then scan it and get some, a figure much more quickly. So, uh, the optimism we had wedged when I proposed this study to you has gotten a little more pessimistic as we've gotten into some of these logistical kind of things we get into. Not to say that they won't be figured out, but again, just this, when you scan, all you get is right on top, but the cows are eating more than what is right on top. That's where I thought you were going. Uh -huh. <laughs> that therein lies one of the great problems with all grazing. Um, when we as grazers go into a field, we have no real hard numbers of what that field is gonna produce. If we go in and take four examples and send them into the lab, whatever we, wherever we send them, we're looking at at least a 10 to a 14 day lag and in most cases, that forage will have already been grazed and passed through the backside of the fertilizer distributor on the cow. So everything that we spent to get that sample analyzed really was mute at the time. So, I mean, those are some of the things that as grazers, we are we're going through some changing times, folks. Uh, I know in the fencing industry, there are some changes coming down the road for large farms that will be a whole lot less expensive than building hard fences around the farm. But they won't work for the small man because he doesn't have that much area to worry about. He's gonna have to go with some type of fencing program and some type of grazing management program to suit his particular need. And that's, that's the, the biggest problem in this whole spectrum is trying to advise people what is best for them to do on a daily basis or a weekly basis. I don't want to go out further than a week, really, in my opinion. Some people graze forever, but when you go by the farm, you can tell who is a full-time grazer because they have nothing but dust in their fields. So... I mean, well, and you're saying a full time grazer, but that's meaning the, the cows are full time grazers that the, per right. the person is obviously not a full time grazer we in have. Those kind of situations. And that's what we're coming from in Louisiana is a lot of people do only uh, continual grazing. They might fence off half to plant their ryegrass on half in the fall and then simply open the gate, you know, uh, at some point, maybe December, maybe Jan in, in an ideal world, December is when people would open that gate. And I know there's a lot of people that do that two hour window, but Wedge has written down in his notes right here, rest is the main concern for growing any forage. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about any other methods that might work besides that two hour thing and besides continuing? Well, if, if you're gonna plant a, a X number of acres of rye grass for your particular operation, I would suggest you plant it in two, two places. In other words, you would have one field that you would turn into however many days it lasted, and then you would bring them out and go to that second field, and hopefully you had enough rest in between. The problem with doing that, as we alluded to earlier, was when you do those sorts of things, you're not taking into account the waste of the material when you turn into that whole field. I mean, to me, it is ludicrous to plant 10 acres of grass and only be able to, in reality, harvest seven acres of it because you've messed on it, urination, sleep on it, walk on it, whatever. 
So those are the problems that, that the a lot of grazers face. And I don't know all, I definitely don't know all the answers, don't have to purport to. But I, I do believe that a good management system uh, will work. This regenerative thing where we're worried about and studying soil health and runoffs and all of those sorts of things is very real and very viable that we need to continue studying it and continue using it. Uh, I know where we are, we had no earthworms in our pastures 15, 20 years ago. Now I can only find them under a thistle bush, but at least I'm finding earthworms now. Um, how did we get there? We biggest thing we did, we cut back on organic fertilizer because number one, it's so blooming expensive. And we are using mixes of grasses. Uh, Dr. Pat is providing some wonderful clover products. We're using vetches. One of the warm season legumes we can look at is sun hemp, which everybody throws their hands up in the air when you say hunt sun hemp. But mm -hmm. I have grazed it, uh, not perfectly because there was no information when I planted it, but it has a place in the grazing world, I think. And it's a legume. So uh, these are the things that you have to research on your own. You have to ask questions. You have to affiliate yourself with like-minded people. Don't go to the coffee shop and talk to the guy that's a, a Marlboro cowboy with a $10,000 trailer and a $15,000 horse. Uh, he's not in it to make money. And if you're in this to make a dollar, you better economize is all I can say. Before we wrap up, I know we're kind of getting to the end of our hour. I, I've got to say something about forage quality and about legumes. Uh, legumes, when you add a legume to a pasture mix, you'd like 25% is what I would tell people to shoot for. If you've got a 20, 25%, you'll almost always see a 20% improvement in animal performance. It's just as you can book it every time you get. And I'm going to bring up a misnomer to you about forage quality per se. Forage quality uh, is a good estimate, but it really doesn't predict gains very well. When I was a student, Al, when they would analyze alfalfa, they always had what they called a fudge factor. that They would measure, they would predict the gains, and they'd bump it up by 10%, because when they measured forage quality versus what they saw in the animals, the animal performance always better. They didn't know what that fudge factor was, but we do now, and it's, and it's about the digestion rate. Alfalfa and all legumes digest much more quickly than when a grass will. And a cool season grass like ryegrass digests at a much faster rate than what Bermuda grass does. So it's always one of those things, ryegrass, if you look at the forage quality of ryegrass, you would never believe cattle will gain 2.75 pounds a day. But they do, and it's because the residence time in the rumen, they go through it so fast, instead of staying in the rumen in the classical 48 hours, which is how lab analysis measure forage quality adjustability, it might only be in there for 24, so they blow it through so quickly. They're digesting all the most readily available nutrients, and then they're passing it on out, and they're getting to something else. So forage quality is quite critical, but I, I don't ever want to leave without pushing this thing about putting some clovers out there. My personal favorite one is uh, the white clovers, and I'd say that because white clover is well adapted to almost any area you're going to uh, get into, and plus they tend to like very close grazing. And Generally, in any, any farming operation, once you've been through a cold winter, been feeding hay every day for the last 100, 110 days, the last thing you want to do is put out more hay, and people tend to start grazing their pastures too quickly, and that only helps white clover. White clover, you can't graze it out. Now, you can smother it by letting the grass grow up too big around it and it shades it out, but clo white clover really likes close, continuous grazing. Uh, red clover is a great clover to put out there, but you have to manage it because it's one of those more robust clovers. That it not, likes to be look, grow up tall, graze down, grow up tall. It sits in nice with some rotational grazing systems. So, again, it, it takes going out there, paying attention to what's going on in the farm, watching the cows. When you see the loose bowels, that's pretty good. I've, probably the most question I've been asked in my life is, my cows have diarrhea. And I, you, my stock answer is, if you've got cows on ryegrass and it's not, you got bigger problems than you think you do, buddy. <laughs> Time. 
so we are right at the hour. And so we're going to switch over to Bethany is going to do um, the t-shirt drawing, but I just wanted to thank everyone for being on the call today. Um, like I said at the beginning, if you have a few more questions, we can stay on for a few more minutes after the fact. But Bethany, if you want to share your screen, she's going to show our winner for today's presentation. So we've got Justin, congratulations. Justin, I'm gonna send you a direct message over Zoom and ask for your size and your address. Um, and then if you guys need to drop off, you are more than welcome to, or we can stay for a few more minutes to keep questions going in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and just have an open discussion. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks for setting this up. Thank you. Wedge, always a pleasure to be on the program with you, buddy. He stepped out for a moment, but I will certainly relay the message. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Any other thoughts that uh, you're unclear about? I, it's, uh, you know, you think about it. Cattle are dynamic. They're always changing. Forage, origin forage quality is always a dynamic and it's always changing. And you're trying to put those two systems together which is why management is so critical and all because you have to manage the pastures. You also have to manage the cattle because uh, as much as we'd like to think that I can rest those pastures for a while, cows want to eat every day. So you, it, it's, uh, it gets into, we make money on the cow. We, we get direct cash for the we cows. We see that kind of money. The forages make us money, but we really don't see dollar bills coming from the sale barn or how we're selling those cattle. You know, um, I would say one one of our biggest mistakes that we have made has been grazing too, figuring, and, and we're still figuring this out, grazing too early. So, you know, when the ryegrass is, is this tall, like you said, the cattle want to want to be fed every day. And sometimes we don't have a sacrifice area. And so we just have to kind of manage or we have to do something like that. But more or, or we've planted and the cattle are still in that same pasture and we just don't get them off soon enough. And that's been a, a, a problem too. And, and I think one thing that someone has said along the way is to go out and actually pull on your forage and see how firm those roots are. That was an actual physical way to test and see if it's ready to graze at all. And if, because cattle are gonna wrap that tongue around and pull upward and whenever, and it pulls upward and sideways. So if you can do that with your finger on your forage and it not pull the roots out, then it, it at least can tolerate some grazing. And that's one, that's just one of our biggest mistakes we've made is, is having cattle on it way too early, um, really out of necessity. You know, we've, yes. as we've grown well too fast. Ryegrass, fortunately for ryegrass, has a pretty extensive and thick root system. Very, very fibrous root system. Uh, I was gonna bring up and just forgot, uh, we almost always, put in a small grain with our ryegrass. And the one we liked was, was rye. Uh, a lot of people confuse it and think it's the same thing, two different crops. Rye is a cereal grain. It's probably the quickest to germinate when we would plant it. Uh, it was unusual not to see rye germinate with that two days. Uh, ryegrass, based on how the moisture is, might be more like a week, but rye was always the first crop up, uh, put its head up really quickly, but it also was the first one to die out, but it would die out in the middle of March, which the ryegrass is just roaring and going so fast that you don't miss it. And rye, though, has a very weak and poor root system. Uh, in wet conditions, we would always find, even in the middle of winter, we'd always find where the cows, when they wrap that tongue around, even larger plants of rye, they would pull it out of the ground. Now, we didn't see that problem with ryegrass, but I know the peanut farmers in Georgia used to use rye as a cover crop for their peanuts because it had such a thin system, root system. When they got ready to, uh, to go in and kill their, <laughs> their winter crop and dis to put their, uh, their peanuts in, cereal rye is by far the easiest thing in the world to plow behind because it's, it's barely got a root system at all. Nothing as extensive as what ryegrass, which probably has three or four times a root mass with the same height of a cereal rye would. But rye was always a little more winter tolerant. Uh, people always ask me, used to, should I plant a cold tolerant variety? Should I just plant gold? Or do I want a more cold tolerant, something like Marshall or Jackson? Or should I ask rye? And my stock answer wedge was, 
Well, if you can tell me what the winter's going to be like in, in four or five months from now, I can tell you exactly what crop to plant. But it's you just hedge your bets as best as you can. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best, right? The American farmer, the biggest dreamer in the world, borrows a million dollars, <laughs> buries it in the ground, and hopes he gets something in return at the end of the year. <laughs> yes. That is optimism. But it keeps us going too, doesn't it? <laughs> True. Um, if you're not if you're not an optimist, you're probably not in farming. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, I had a thought the other day I want to run by you. What would be the possibility of planting regular peanuts into a pasture system and grazing the greens on top of those peanuts? Well, you know, there is a forage peanut that uh, University of Florida released several years ago. Uh, and yes. and we, tried it, we tried it a couple of years and, and just didn't uh, have a very good, uh, uh, didn't get a very good stand of it. And it, uh, the cows grazed it out and it was gone. In. The one that I have always been enamored with, there's a, it's uh, called napier grass or elephant grass is another word for it. There was a dwarf elephant, and we found a variety of dwarf elephant grass. The only problem was it had kind of like a sugar cane looking stalk. And the only way, there was no seed production on it. The only way to plant the stuff is you had to cut the canes off and bury it in the ground, kind of like sugar cane. And new plants would come from those little uh, nodes on it. And the reason I bring it up was uh, when I was at, one of the years I was at Rosepine, we had a, a about a two acre forage varietal test area. We had you know, bunches of varieties of alfalfa, red clover, white clover, briar grasses, all these kind of things in there. But we also had along the back fence line, there was this row and it was about six feet wide and about 20 feet long of dwarf elephant grass. But just so happened as usual things happened, they were in a rush to leave the, pl the plot area. It was fenced off by itself. When a rush leave on a Friday afternoon and left the gate open. And of course that's the weekend the cows break out. And I was on duty that weekend. I go by there Saturday morning. There's this herd of cows in our small plot area. And after I ran them out, I turned around. They were all kind of tracks through the alfalfa and the white clover and the rye grass, but they had eaten that dwarf elephant grass into the ground. And I, and, but we never really did anything with it, Tara. Simply from the standpoint is the only way to plant it was to cut the canes off of it and hand plant that stuff in a pasture. We just never thought anybody would go to the time and effort to do something like that. Uh, but hopefully one of these days they're gonna figure out how to make it. There was a lot of talk that they could take it to Hawaii and make it make its own seed. And until you can plant a seed or it's a lot easier than that, uh, it's, it's just hard to talk anybody into going to that area of effort to put something like that out there. We've always looked for a summer creek grazing area, but you gotta have something high enough quality it's going to make the baby calves want to leave mama in June and July and go to this higher quality pasture. And we've tried white clover, alfalfa. We've tried them all and they won't leave mom. You know, and they're just, just like most kids are, they're, they're most comfortable around mama. And in the wintertime, when mom's on hay and, and this, the pasture all brown and dry, they love to go to those ryegrass pastures, but we haven't duplicated that in any kind of summer creek grazing yet. You know, the only thing we've seen with summer creek grazing has been the next paddock in that one that we have that's divided. They're wanting the calves will be the in the next paddock that's an upcoming move. The leader follower theory, yeah. Yeah, again, who do you make money on? Those ba selling those baby calves. So of course, everything you, sh you, sh you should do, whatever makes them grow better, that's what we want to do. You know, by the time mom is three months out, that calf is three months old, mom is either pregnant or not. And, you know, so she's probably pregnant. She, you know, she's milked about all she's going to do. So all the effort should be going to the calves because that's what's going to make you the money the rest of the time. You don't want to run the mom into the ground too much, but she's going to be where she's going to be and you're going to keep her next year. So uh, doing too much for her doesn't make any difference. It's putting an emphasis on the calves and making them gain weight is where you're going to make your best money. That was a great concept. The creep, creep grazing, I have not heard that term before, but I, I think that's a wonderful concept. Noble Foundation back years ago did a lot of work with creep grazing uh, calves ahead of the cows. Uh, that R.L. Dalrymple had a lot to do with that probably 25 years ago. 
Well, I see Roberta's mentioned about uh, iron clay peas. That's uh, we're we're I still haven't given up on this idea. So that's one of the ones we're looking at. Uh, there's the peas. There's you, you know the one that uh, in wedge. I think wedge and I've talked about this before. I think I get shot for planting it. But you know one of the one of the summer one of the summer forages that cows like better than anything else in the world is kudzu. Illegal as heck to plant it, you know, and everybody cusses you for doing it. But if you think about it, you never see kudzu in a pasture where the cows are because they like it and they eat it so much. But wedge, you know, if you planted a creek grazing area in the middle of the field, somebody from the FBI would probably be there to haul you off here pretty soon and put you in jail. <laughs> no, no, they they would find a dead body in the field because my brother has already told me if you plant one stalk of kudzu on this place, I'll kill you. <laughs> and I really think he would do it. <laughs> so is, is Roberta I, I on 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 some in Alabama, though, that uh, have cut zoo that encroaches into their pastures off the mountainside and off the highway right of ways. And these are purebred operations. And they say as soon as they turn those cows into those particular pastures, they don't amble over there or walk over there. <laughs> they sprint over there and eat it to the ground. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it could be utilized, but it's going to take one management nightmare to make it work. Yes. Iron and clay peas might be a better one. Uh, there's some, you know, there's a Laredo soybean, those old black bean soybeans that are out there. So we're going to get into trying some more of those kind of things to see if we can turn it into summer creek grazing here that the calves would like. Bring your ideas to my house. We'll try anything okay. once. I'm like Mike. <laughs> try it. You try Mike. Other than the kudzu, right? <laughs> Other, no, don't bring the kudzu. Uh -uh, no. Ooh, ooh. I value my life too much. <laughs> well, Any more questions? Perfect. I see Justin Bird on there. That's the gentleman who has got his doctor degree from University of Georgia, I think now is at uh, Texas A&M, if my memory serves me correct. Yes, sir. That uh, is correct. Good to, good to hear from you, Justin. Congratulations on your PhD. Thank you. Uh, you were talking about the grazing the peanuts. Uh, Jennifer Tucker actually had, she did a demo, like an extension demo type thing with grazing peanuts. So you could talk to her and she can give you a little bit more information on that probably on what they saw, I, and saw that on, I saw that on something that I on the internet the other night some one of her articles popped up somewhere and I will go back and talk with her yes definitely uh, that may be a viability in our part of the world uh, the the grazing peanut that Dr. Pat was talking about it's pretty stinky on you know, what kind of soil it will work in it takes an awful lot of management to get it started, I only know of one plot of uh, that type of peanut in East Feliciana Parish, and it was started as a LSU project probably 30 years ago. Uh, of course, that gentleman has moved on, and the operators on that farm now still cut a little hay off of it, but they cannot keep it in pristine condition, let's say. But uh, the, the old common peanut, I mean, Mississippi grows thousands of tons of peanuts every year. I mean, you'll go up and down the highway, everybody got boiled peanuts for sale. Uh, why can't we use the tops for the cows? Even could we use the tops as after they take them and dig them? I mean, th there's all kinds of products out there. Probably it could be used, but is it economical to get them to where you need them and if the freight doesn't kill you, you know, maybe it'll work. So. Any other questions? It's been a pleasure, guys. <laughs>